from dust inhalation. Um, before the white helmets and various other kind of media operators had burst in, hosed down the children and started yelling chemical attack before, of course, they started providing the narrative to the mainstream media. Um, shortly after the attack, I myself interviewed uh, medical staff in Duma and they pretty much all said what this guy said to me. Uh, Every journalist that went in and spoke to the medical staff there, it was, it was obvious there had not been a chemical attack. For one thing, we went in, I think it was less than a week after the attack, and, and at that point, everyone was screaming sorry. And yet, we were walking around the area perfectly safely. Markets had been set up right next to, or only a few hundred meters away from the point where the attack had allegedly taken place. We couldn't actually go there at the time because the OPCW inspectors had just gone in. Um, then, um, if we go to May 2019, the Working Group on Syria Propaganda and Media um, received or, or released the first um, communication from a whistleblower. Um, OPCW staff members have communicated with the working group. We have learned that an investigation was undertaken by an engineering sub-team of the FFM, beginning with an on-site inspection in April, May 2018, followed by a detailed engineering analysis, including collaboration on computer and modeling studies with two European universities. The report of this investigation was excluded from the published final report of the fact-finding mission. So here we started to learn for the first time about the suppression of information 
by the OPCW, one can only presume that they were being coerced or pressurized by their main funding partners, and as I've just proven, Canada is their top donor. Um, so basically what this engineering report did was to state that effectively the only conclusion they could draw from their engineering analysis and investigation was that the cylinders that we saw that had presumably, or we were told, had been dropped by Syrian aircraft, by Syrian helicopter, and had somehow miraculously come through the roof, landed on the bed, and the bed hadn't collapsed, and none of the ornaments around the bed had actually fallen off the shelving. We were supposed to believe that, that this was the actual reality. What the engineer's report showed was that this could not possibly be reality, and that those cylinders must have been placed there. So this was the first indication that effectively the White Helmets and their, their media cohorts had staged and created um, this narrative. And in fact, a previous White Helmet promotional video made in 2017 in Khan al where terrorist groups actually carried out chemical attacks against the Syrian Arab army and civilians in March 2013, just before the alleged Ghouta chemical attack in August 2013. Um, and at this point, the White Helmets were also claiming that a Syrian Arab army jet had, had miraculously delivered this cylinder. Um, going forward very quickly to November 2019, we had the first indication that there are more whistleblowers, there are more people coming forward um, to basically question um, and to complain about the way that the OPCW conducted this investigation and omitted a huge amount of, of analysis um, and, and work by both scientists and engineers. Um, <clears throat> I thoroughly recommend that everyone reads this article by Peter Hitchens. Um, but basically, the main key points um, that he draws upon uh, and he actually met with the whistleblower. Um, he read the email that the whistleblower had sent to the OPCW team. Um, but basically, uh, the, Duma, the report on the Duma incident had been so slashed and censored that it misrepresented the facts by leaving out key information. It hid the fact that the traces of chlorine found on site were merely tiny trace elements, parts per billion and in forms that could have been found in any household bleach. Actually, in my rounds of, of the various um, uh, extremist group centers and so on, what I found were huge amounts of EU-supplied um, water purifying tablets. I mean, boxes and boxes and boxes of this, and of course that will contain elements of bleach. Um, it contained major deviations from the original report submitted by impartial experts so that it had morphed into something quite different. It actually morphed into something that would um, retrospectively justify the French, UK and US unlawful aggression against Syria, which of course they bombed Syria before the OPCW had even gone in or even produced its report. Um, the OPCW report, according to the whistleblowers, suppressed a total mismatch between the symptoms allegedly displayed by the victims at the scene and the effects of the chemicals which were actually found. The symptoms seen on harrowing videos shown at the time of the incident simply did not match the symptoms which would have been caused by any material found at the site. And of course, the interview that you just saw, which was only one among many that I did with medical staff, said exactly the same thing. Now, Coming back to James Lemazurier, um, again, I recommend that you read the article that I've just published, which goes into a much deeper investigation of his death and the possible reasons behind it. Um, but what is fascinating is that part of um, the information that is slowly being released by uh, either former members or current members of the OPCW um, organization is that James Lemazurier was meeting regularly with leaders of the OPCW team, and the purpose of the meetings was, amongst other things, to provide witnesses to the alleged chemical weapon attacks. And as David Miller, who's an academic but part of the Syria Working Group, he points out, the, witness, the process of witness selection was contaminated by an operative, a former British military intelligence operative, 
paid by several of the belligerents in the conflict, most obviously the UK government, to select witnesses from another organisation that is also paid by the belligerents in the conflict. So again, we're seeing this closed loop of information laundering and production in order to, to demonise only one side in the conflict. We also know um, recently, again through information that's been released, that the OPCW inspectors are being intimidated and lent upon by US officials um, and are being coerced into producing untrue reports. Um, all those who have questioned this narrative um, have met with a concerted and vicious media campaign to discredit them and I'm only posting here or presenting one of those articles, this was in the Sunday Times, it was centre page, um, to say that the Duma attack was staged is to enter an Orwellian world. Well, okay, we're in the Orwellian world, but the Orwellian world is the fact that these media entities did not even entertain the idea that this might have been staged, that this might have been um, created just as the weapons of mass destruction was created in Iraq in order to justify military aggression against an independent country. Um, just to give you an idea of, of the tactics used by these media outlets, the photo you've just seen was actually cropped from this photo to try and show me as being on my own with President Assad. In fact, I was there in July 2016 with the US Peace Council delegation um, who went there to inform themselves on the situation in Syria and to try and further peace in the region by raising awareness. Now, I have myself um, very important questions to ask here. As far as I'm concerned, it's very clear that the Duma chemical attack was staged. It's very clear that the white helmets were instrumental in that staging. It's very clear that the OPCW suppressed information in its report in order, as I said, to justify the UK, US and French unlawful aggression against Syria. It has to raise questions over their previous claims of chemical attacks. We know that in Khan Shehun, the chain of custody um, was absolutely corrupted. Evidence was collected by the White Helmets and the armed groups. It was, it was supplied via a number of intermediaries. We have to be raising those questions, but the questions that are the most important ones for me right now is who killed the children and civilians that we see in the staged event that was produced by the White Helmets and picked up by the media entities? Where are the bodies that Raid Saleh, the leader of the White Helmet group, allegedly located for the OPCW that was reported in the Telegraph at the time? Where are those bodies? And in this picture, why is this white helmet operative wearing a gas mask, but no gloves? Perhaps this is why. I'd like you to just listen to <clears throat> Iraq weapons inspector Scott Ritter actually talking about the white helmets at the time of the Khan Shehun attack in 2017, which of course again precipitated um, <coughs> Trump's, uh, Trump's missile launch against Syria. Right off the bat, when you have samples taken by an interested party, in this case, uh, the rebels on the ground, in particular an NGO known as the White Helmets, um, they, they, they took sampling without any protocol on the 4th of April. Uh, nine days later, they turned these samples over to the OPCW, and the OPCW accepts these as viable sampling. Right off the bat, any finding that is derived from these samples is, is illegitimate in the eyes of the inspection business. So why the OPCW goes goes further and, and says, these samples show this, that's irrelevant. These samples aren't samples. They don't count as samples. They weren't taken by your team. Your team can't vouch for their, um, for their veracity. Therefore, you shouldn't be talking about them. And that's the heart of my, of, of, my, of my problem here, is that the OPCW violated every procedure it has in place that's supposed to guarantee its integrity as an organization. And in doing so, it's lost its integrity. And as you point out, the White Helmets are not an uninterested party. They're funded by the United States government and other Western governments in the millions of dollars. So even that would certainly 
raise the, the conflict of interest suspicion, would it not? Well, not, 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 not just that. They, uh, they, they, they peacefully coexist with Al Nusra, which is an Al Qaeda affiliate. And, you know, um, I just, I, that, that automatically disqualifies them. But even more so, uh, you know, I, I asked the OPCW to explain. They used the term chemical sampling unit. They're, they're supposedly a chemical sampling unit with the white helmets. I looked at the videos. They're wearing training suits. Yeah, uh, they're, 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 uh, well, no, no. Some of them actually wore, they, it's like they're playing Halloween dress up. They dressed up as if they were actual inspectors, state and said, but they're wearing training suits, which provide no protection. Uh, they, it, it's a joke. What they did, everything they did was theatrical. It was, it was a visual designed to confuse uh, or send a false signal to an unknowing audience. But to a, an expert like me, uh, you know, I was a hazardous materials specialist on, a, on the USAR team, urban search and rescue team here in New York. Uh, that was my job, is to do uh, hazardous material sampling at the chemical weapons uh, release site. Um, what they did was a joke. It didn't even come close to, um, to, to meeting any, any standard quality control. Right off the bat, when you have sample... Um, Hitchens, uh, when he wrote a follow-up article um, to his initial um, whistleblower leak, I think what he said was quite chilling. Um, in decades of journalism, I have received quite a few leaks, but never one like this. It scared me. If it was true, then something hugely dishonest and dangerous was going on. If bodies like the OPCW cannot be trusted, then World War III could one day be started by a falsehood. We've seen wars against independent nations, target nations, prey nations, started on a falsehood many times now. It's really time that we stand up um, against this hideous manipulation of fact. And manip it's, it's basically a gaslighting of public, um, striking fear into a public of, of sort of national security being breached, of the terrorist threat. Terrorism has increased since 9-11. So despite the war on terror, it's increased exponentially. And we have to start asking why. We have to start asking why we're allowing our governments and our governmental media to basically inform us of what the reality is. We have to start searching for the reality as it really is, not what is presented to us by corrupted organizations and compromised organizations. And as far as the white helmets are concerned, what I've already alluded to, why is there no public inquiry into this organization? I have my own answers on that, because basically the white helmets underpinned the entire information war against Syria. But why, genuinely speaking here, I'm paying for this organization effectively, because I'm contributing to the taxes that are being used to fund this operation. So why is there no demand for a public inquiry? Why are they not being investigated? If one member participates in an execution or a war crime, the entire organization should come under a legal investigation or an independent review, surely. I mean, we've seen it recently with Oxfam, with the reports of um, abuse against refugees. We've seen it with the Red Cross. Why are the White Helmets immune from any kind of genuine investigation into their activities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vanessa. That's a lot to take in, obviously, and we're going to cut to our question period shortly. But first, I should mention, this talk was uh, very difficult to organize, the tour in general. Uh, Vanessa, in challenging the white helmets, in challenging this narrative and investigating it, is putting herself up against state forces. She is putting herself in opposition to the British state, the Canadian state, the U.S. state, and other states that are part of this alliance 
that is involved openly in regime change in Syria. This tour itself has faced difficulties. Three of the venues have almost been canceled. Um, they had to be rebooked. There is a concerted or concerted effort to block Vanessa from speaking in every city that she has gone to. And there has been some successes in that regard. Um, and there have been rebookings. You will want to check the Facebook national tour site because some venues have had to be rebooked. Uh, so with that in mind, um, we want to point out that uh, touring Vanessa on this subject and challenging a major propaganda narrative is challenging and difficult and um, we are going to be engaging in fundraising today, voluntary fundraising. If you want to help uh, Vanessa with the rest of this tour and to account for costs in this uh, instance, but also for the rest of her Eastern Canada and also Montreal uh, tour, um, there, there has been challenges and, and some difficulties, but uh, with starting with the support of people here, we hope to be able to overcome any challenges to bookings and other issues relating to the tour. So. Uh, did you want to actually say some words about the fundraising? Or? Well, I did want to mention something, brothers and sisters, and that uh, New Vision United Church and Reverend uh, Ian Sloan were also subject to the same pressure that caused Palestine House to cancel, the Steelworkers Center in Toronto to cancel, and uh, St. Paul's University in Ottawa to cancel. Um, we have, as Brendan has said, we have secured other venues. But we want to say, Thank you very much to Reverend Ian Sloan for standing up to these cowardly people. Yeah. Vanessa has told me that in Europe uh, there's a name for what's going on and it's called deplatforming, where the, 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 the opposition, the people who do not want Vanessa's exposés to be shown, uh, instead, of what the, instead of coming out to argue or writing uh, counter uh, articles in newspapers, they try to cancel the venues where she's speaking. Who did? So, uh, I don't know these people. I don't know their names, actually. It's so, not the focus of the talk, however, there have been a random assortment of people claiming affiliation with the Syrian opposition. Those are some of them. <laughs> and or the White Helmets, and there are people on Facebook and other people. They're just random people, some of whom are not actually who they say they are, or even in Canada. Um, it, this has happened whenever you tour someone about Syria. It happened with Eva Bartlett as well, and it's just routine. Um, they're, they're, they org the supporters of the White Helmets and propaganda campaign uh, have made difficulties for all of the events. And unfortunately, it's just a cost of doing business. And uh, this organization respects democracy and free speech. And in, in that sense, we want Vanessa to be able to talk. We want people to be able to talk to Vanessa. We want people to be able to oppose Vanessa's lecture if they want to by talking on their own time, on their own platforms, on their own podiums, but not by canceling tours, not by canceling Vanessa and preventing people from speaking and preventing people from hearing. So it's in that spirit of democracy that we're passing the hat at this time. And uh, we will be, I think, perhaps upgrading our question period. Uh, we had planned to use uh, cards for this question period as they're being handed out now. But we might be able to switch it to a, a, a vocal open question period via selection of hands as that may be more organic. I don't know, what do people think? Do you want to do it that way, or cards? What, what, which way do you? Questions. questions. Oral, oral questions. questions. Okay. If, if that's the case, we can do oral questions, uh, but we of course just put some written ones. Yeah. I'll deal with those. And we will we'll take the written ones first that she just received. But otherwise, we're going to oral questions, and that means following the important principles of respect that operate here at New Vision United Church. And that means respect for the speaker, respect for the questioner, and uh, so as such, Vanessa will be taking questions, but we will not be taking questions that contain racist or sexist or homophobic content or any forms of hate speech. We want to discuss the issues here about Syria, about white helmets, about Canada and what Canada's role is in this conflict. And we'll be more than happy to go around and show of hands, pick, pick people out to... Uh, to talk with Vanessa. The only other thing is, as part of that venue of respect, uh, we cannot have back and forth between Vanessa and people in the audience. It, once she answers your question, we have to move on to other questions in the audience. 
Um, and we want to give everyone a chance, men, women, people of all ethnicities and origins, uh, and give everyone a fair shot at getting their voice heard. That means you can make a statement too if you want, but it has to be kept under two minutes, as do questions, because we have to have time for other people so we can't go on and on. And we will cut you off if you go up to beyond two minutes in a question or statement. So uh, with that in mind, that is the fundraising hat, and uh, we welcome you to contribute to that. Um, and it's like a it's uh, <laughs> awkward. So um, we'll start out with the written questions that we've received so far. It's uh, only fair to the people that have been writing down <laughs> questions. Okay. Yes. So I think uh, Vanessa can start with these questions. I guess they're anonymous. That's okay. Okay. So the first one. Um, you've made a very convincing case against the White Helmet. However, is Assad not equally guilty of massacre of innocent Syrians? Didn't say anything. Um, well, in reality, and, and this is my slight tongue-in-cheek answer, I don't think I have to say anything because the mainstream media is swamping us with demonization of President Assad. But on the serious note, um, and this is a very important point, first of all, this war is not about President Assad. It's not about one man. It's about Syria defending itself against an invasion, a terrorist invasion, which is financed and supported and armed by our governments. If President Assad were to leave Syria tomorrow, do you really think that the Syrian people are going to stop defending themselves and defending their right to live in a secular state and not live under an extremist, tyrannical, sectarian rule? No. So I think, you know, this conflation of is one man killing innocent <coughs> Syrian people, it's an insult. I'm sorry to say that, but it's, for me, it's an insult to the Syrian people. If you go back to 2012, you'll find a very good article by Jonathan Steele in The Guardian where he basically says what every single media outlet is ignoring is the popularity <coughs> of President Assad. If, if there were to be UN-observed elections now, President Assad would be re-elected, and he'd probably be re-elected with a stronger majority than in 2014. So I think what is very important to understand here is that every single Syrian and the Syrian army is the Syrian people. It's not some kind of Assad militia as it's described in Western media. It's battling for its survival. It's battling for the survival of its country. And Assad is a part of that battle. He is not killing innocent people. He's defending innocent people against ethnic cleansing mercenaries who are far better armed and equipped than the Syrian army. And he is fighting a war that is not of his making. He's fighting a war that was externally imposed upon Syria and fermented by external belligerence. People are dying, innocent people are dying. I've seen it many times. Everybody who's been to Syria and speaks to any family in Syria will hear, will hear some of the most terrible stories. But is Assad, is the Syrian Arab army causing those deaths? No, they're preventing them. In every single liberation campaign, the Syrian government alongside the Russian government have provided humanitarian corridors for civilians to leave the conflict areas, and Idlib is no different. Who's preventing them from leaving? The Western-backed armed groups, who are either charging them extortionate amounts to leave by the humanitarian corridors after having bled them dry economically for the entire time of their occupation, stolen their houses, taxed them, etc. And then asking them for money to leave to safety, to the safety of the Syrian Arab army and the Russian medical teams, for example, or shelling them as they're trying to leave. So I understand this question because it's true. I don't condemn the Syrian government at any time because what I see is a Syrian government that is fighting for its people, that despite economic terrorism, despite a military war by some of the most powerful nations in this world, this government is still 
functioning. It is still supplying electricity. It is still supplying food. It is still supplying subsidized food to people that can't afford to pay the everyday prices. It is still providing every single essential item to its people. I find that extraordinary, and I challenge anyone to find a Western government that would be able to do that for nine years under those punishing conditions. Yeah, here. Um, somebody asked me what OPCW stands for. I thought I said it. But it's the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. Um, why the Syrian Arab army, and not just the Syrian army, I think that goes back to the days of the United Arab Republic, um, when Syria and Egypt um, were combined as a force, if you like. Um, and I think it's a very clear um, identity for the army. It's the Syrian Arab army. It's an army which is considered always traditionally to have defended the Palestinian cause, for example. So in other words, it's not only focused in, um, in, in a national sense, it's focused internationally in the region. So I think, and I think that was all to do with the unification of the Arab nations against the threat of imperialism, of course, because divided, it's much easier um, to, to destabilize them, as we've seen. Uh, why is the UK Labour Party silent? That's also a very good question. <laughs> and I wish, I, I wish they would answer it. Um, I think a lot of the problem within the Labour Party is, unfortunately, um, Jeremy Corbyn, who's actually one of the very few genuinely anti-war politicians in the West um, with any chance uh, of leadership, um, but unfortunately, within his own party, he's completely marooned by, by the Blairites, um, who's, who of course support, I mean basically there's very little difference between them and the Tory government, as the same in America now, there's very little difference between the Republicans and the Democrats as regards um, you know, globalism and military adventurism. So, I think in answer to your question, they do as much as they can, they do question the government on a number of occasions. Um, <clears throat> uh, I wish they would do more, but I kind of understand the position that Corbyn is in. I think what's important is that we somehow get him elected and then give him a chance to actually stand by his principles, which to be fair, he always has them. I know that he's weakened on the anti-Semitic stance, etc., and that was a huge disappointment for me. Um, but really and truly in the UK, I can safely say he's our only chance of stopping these continuous um, imperialist interventions. Um, yeah. You used a term at the beginning of your talk, something like information complex, NGOs, military media, etc. Um, can I expand? If I had another hour, <laughs> um, but very quickly, um, what I call, the, or, or what is termed the soft power complex or the smart power complex um, is a concept that I think particularly after the Iraq war, um, the US and the UK intelligence recognized the fact that they couldn't anymore intervene directly and militarily because it, it would create um, a backlash of public opinion. So what they employ now is what I call the smart power complex, which is a complex of NGOs, and I would put Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, the White Helmets, uh, there are hundreds if not thousands of them. I describe it like a hydra, you cut the head off one and another one grows back. Um, but all of these organizations are effectively funded by the same entities, the billionaire complex that I talked about, um, I do recommend that you read the three articles that I've written because it goes into huge depth about the organizations that are basically being funded um, by the billionaire complex who are effectively driving these capitalist regime change wars um, for their own benefit. Um, because of course all of these wars um, precipitate resource plundering, um, which includes water, 
um, not only oil, of course, and gas, but also, in my opinion, one of the biggest harvests is the human trafficking. Um, and there are huge links between this billionaire complex and the human trafficking operations that are going on as a result of these hideous wars that are sort of forced upon these nations. Um, so basically it's a complex of organizations which are apparently non-profit, non-governmental organizations which we are usually funded by governmental organizations one way or another and are working to their agenda. Uh, Um, the Syrian Arab Army recently launched a strike against oil being smuggled by ISIS. I think it was by the Kurds, actually. Um, how much pillaging and looting of Syrian property has been done? Um, I had a meeting with the director of the museum in Damascus um, about a year ago, and he told me more than one million artifacts have been um, stolen from Syria and have been sold um, on the open market. Um, when the Turkish militant groups or backed militant groups um, invaded Aleppo, they basically dismantled and stole, I think it was more than 3,000 factories and took them and re-established them in Turkey. <clears throat> and in fact, in, in almost every single region, that the armed groups are in, that's what they've done. They've stripped bare the railways, they've stripped bare the industry, and all of that material um, has gone to Turkey. So this is industrial theft on an on absolutely massive scale. So yeah, I mean, Syria has been uh, pillaged, basically. And of course the oil is, is the big attraction for the US as we can see at the moment, but not only the US, for the UK also actually, who have oil interests already inside Syria. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, can you update us on the present state of tourism to Syria? Uh, in the past, Janice Corkamp traveled and documented her experience. Would you recommend Canadians to travel as tourists? Yes, absolutely. Um, Syria is incredibly safe at the moment. Um, if you go to Damascus, um, you struggle to actually imagine that the, that the mortars were falling in the areas you're standing um, only about 18 months ago. <clears throat> um, it's a beautiful country. Uh, its people are unbelievably generous, kind and hospitable, even under these conditions. It always humbles me greatly um, and saddens me that these people have had to go through this nine-year hell um, and yet are still will still offer you a cup of tea, they'll still offer you what little food they have, they'll invite you into their house um, and it's one of the most beautiful countries in the world, I mean calling it the cradle of civilization is an underestimation, it's, it's stunning. Um, if you can get in touch with any of the very efficient tour agencies that are now working in Damascus, they can organize the whole trip for you. They can organize everything from the visa to the actual um, tour that you, you do. You can come as an individual or you can come as a delegation. Um, if you need any further advice, don't hesitate to contact myself or Janice Corkamp if you're in touch with her um, on Facebook because she may well be organizing um, more delegations in the future and I'm sure she'd be more than happy to take you along. I thoroughly recommend it. Um, it will open your eyes um, to what has been going on in Syria because every single person in the street, as Mark will confirm, will, will tell you exactly what's going on. Um, but just go and see the beauty of this place. Um, it deserves it. And it's not dark tourism as The Guardian has recently described. <laughs> uh, for the ignorant among us, would you please dark tourism? Um, it was an, I, I don't even understand the term myself. It was an article, I think it was The Guardian, um, basically describing it as dark tourism. I think they were trying to say that this is the government trying to cover up the fact that its, com that, that its country is destroyed by inviting tourists in and going, look, we're fine. And, and you know, it was a horrible, horrible, horrible article. 
Um, and The Guardian has produced virtually nothing but horrible articles since 2012 on Syria. So it was a term that they invented. Um, yeah. Um, I remember the Russians uh, sent for an independent investigation into the chemical weapon attack. The Russians found the fakery laughable. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, the Russians, not only the Russians, but I think Syria, um, supported by a number of non-aligned states, has actually requested um, for an OPCW briefing to include the recently released whistleblowing, whistleblower information. Um, Russia was pushing for a, a further investigation even just after Duma. I'm a little bit hazy on, on, on the whole um, when exactly they asked for it, but Russia throughout this has, has basically said, you know, this never happened. Russia, in fact, um, the head of the Amnesty and Reconciliation was the first guy with his uh, cameraman to enter the house. Um, I don't know if you remember that footage, but he went in, and at that point I remember watching the video footage and thinking, but there's all these people around. If this was a sarin attack, you know, people wouldn't still be in the street, kids wouldn't be there playing, people wouldn't, I mean, Sarin is really nasty stuff. So, so certainly, um, a military individual is not going to enter a house if he thinks there's any risk of Sarin without a hazmat suit on. Um, so yeah, Russia is, is pursuing um, the OPCW now, and, and at the same as Syria, they're requesting um, a new OPCW briefing to include the information um, or, or to discuss the information and the dissatisfaction of the whistleblowers in the OPCW process. Whether the OPCW will be allowed to do that is, is questionable. Um, how much influence does the Eretz Israel project play in the balkanization of Syria? Um, yeah. Um, of course it does. I mean, the, if you look at the uh, Yinon plan, um, the idea was to extend to the east of the Euphrates. Now, of course, uh, and again, this might be controversial, but the uh, project which was supported by Israel and the US and the UK, and marketed heavily by the UK, um, was the Kurdish separatist movement. And of course, basically what that was, was using the Kurds as settlers to, to ethnically cleanse, and they did carry out ethnic cleansing programs um, in the Northeast on behalf of Israel. Um, and in fact, um, Erwin Kotler, who I mentioned in my presentation, and Dershowitz are a part of an organization, I think it's, um, I can't remember the title of it exactly, something like Jewish Support for Kurdistan, um, alongside Bernard Henry Levy, who of course is, um, you know, always at the forefront of NATO interventions. Um, but there is an organization actually supporting Kurdistan and Iraq, but, but also they have heavily supported the Kurdistani project um, in the northeast of Syria. So basically, effectively, the Kurds were being used not only to occupy um, US oil interests, but to occupy an ethnically cleansed territory in order, in my belief, for Israel to effectively move into that territory. Can I just finish these and then I'll come to you, sorry. Uh, have you ever asked America's Democracy Now! producers to be interviewed on its show? Uh, that's quite funny, because... Uh, <laughs> uh, no, because there is actually quite a funny story to that. Um, when I was in East Aleppo during the Syrian army liberation in December 2016, I was literally the only Western journalist there, despite the um, relentless sensationalism from Western media for the four and a half years that East Aleppo was actually occupied by the extremist groups. When it came to the liberation of the people that they had defended for four and a half years, and when these people were pouring out of their homes into the Russian uh, organized medical centers, into the refugee centers that had been set up by the Syrian government to feed them and to give them hot drinks, etc., there was not a single Western journalist to be seen 
because basically their entire narrative for four and a half years had just collapsed around their ears, so they disappeared. And at that time, um, a friend of mine who was a former producer at Democracy Now! was pushing Democracy Now! to have me on as the only person on the ground, basically. And this is at the time when Western media was still continuing. I don't know if you remember the, the awful stories of Syrian army raping the women in East Aleppo, and that was even amplified by the UN. They very quickly kind of retracted it and, and put it under the carpet. Because at one point, I did an interview with RT then, and I said, look, I'm standing in the street where they are saying these atrocities are taking place. And you can literally see the Syrian army carrying the bags down for civilians, carrying old ladies down out of their house to take them for medical care. I mean, the, the, it, it, I'm actually speechless because the hideousness of some of the reports that have been put out by Western media that have demonized the Syrian Arab army more than anything else. Because the Syrian Arab army is a conscript army. It is made up of the sons and brothers and uncles and daughters and sisters of every single family in Syria. To even imagine that this army is going to give its life years of service to liberate these areas and then rape them. Um, so in answer to your question, Democracy Now! basically just put out a load of information about the White Helmets and said, but she's questioning the White Helmets, so no, we're not going to have her on Democracy Now! So that's in answer to your question. <laughs> um, what can I do as a Canadian to challenge my government on the funding um, and lying to Canadians to support these criminals? Um, as much as you can. <laughs> Raise awareness as much as you can. Use social media. Use everything in your power. Write to your MPs. Write to your media. Complain about the reports they're putting out. Read as much as you can from independent journalists like Mark, who's Canadian. He's here. He can provide you with information. Um, follow people who are actually on the ground in Syria so that you have the information enabled and that will enable you to push back against what you're being told. Question, 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 and keep questioning them. Don't let them off the hook. It's like with the OPCW situation now. Their narrative is falling apart. I mean, this is equivalent to the weapons of mass destruction, what's happening now. And, and they're suffering. I mean, I can see it but from the increase in attacks on me, on social media, the attacks on everybody who's actually reporting on this. But if they were responsible media, if they were genuine agents of the people, not agents of power, they would be reporting this. I, I remember having a, a private meeting with a BBC journalist, Lise Doucette, in, in Damascus. And I remember saying to her, why is the BBC not investigating the White Helmets? And her answer to me was quite extraordinary, but very revealing. She said to me, oh, we can't because they're too polarizing and they're too controversial. <laughs> I mean, I actually couldn't answer it. I just said, that's a political answer. I mean, you're a spokesperson for the British government at this point. You're not a journalist. Surely, as a journalist, if they're controversial, you should be investigating them. And I have to say, since, since the Duma uh, evidence has started coming in, which has shown that the White Helmet staged and potentially murdered children in order to produce this staged event, silence from Lise Dissert. But the thing is that, that this media, and I remember John Pilger always saying this, you know, we as journalists should be agents of the people. We should be speaking truth to power, not protecting power from truth. And that's what the majority of our media do. So we as individuals, in my opinion, I'm an ordinary person. I decided that there was way too much injustice going on and I had to do something about it. And I think individually, each one of us has to decide what we have the capacity to do and to do it to the best of our ability. Because people's lives depend upon it. The lives of the Syrian people, the lives of the Yemeni people, of the Iraqi people, the Lebanese people, the Libyan people, the Venezuelan people, the Chilean people, the Bolivian people, it's endless. 
but all their lives depend on us raising awareness. Let's not forget about persecuted groups right here in Canada, or the US. Exactly. Same in the UK. Julian Assange. Yeah, Julian Assange. <laughs> you guys want to die, man. Yeah. Is there more cards? Do you want to pick from the audience? Well, I, <laughs> I think this gentleman had his hands up. Yeah, I'll let you choose the hands. Yeah. You're talking about Kurdistan? Yeah. What you, what's your opinion on the situation with Rojava? Is there a Syria? Yeah, Rojava is Syria. What do you know it's, about it's actually. Um, I mean, it's, it's the Kurds, um, unfortunately the Kurds have a history of um, allowing people to co-opt their cause, let's say, right? I'm, I'm being kind, actually. Um, but if we, if we come back to the principle of international law, oh, I'm sorry. if we come back to the principle of international law, <laughs> um, then we should be defending the territorial integrity of any country, right? Um, and Syria, the Kurds settled in Syria. They are not originally from Syria. And in the areas where they were intending to set up Kurdistan, they were the minority by a big, 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 big margin, right? They were power... The Kurds are about and I hate using the word Kurds because there are a number of, of different factions within the Kurds also. Um, the majority of the Kurds in Syria are not actually pro-separatism. But the very small percentage that are pro-separatism are being power multiplied by the US in order to achieve their goals. I mean, I've been very recently to areas like Ain al-Arab, uh, which they call Kobani, to areas of... Um, northern Syria, which they've taken as Rojava, and which has been heavily marketed, particularly by um, the UK, through various organisations. Um, and, you know, what I see now is a, is a, is a to, to some degree, um, a very clever manoeuvring by Russia in particular, because what it's actually done with collaboration with Damascus is create a situation where an even bigger threat to the Kurds has been allowed to enter Syrian territory, which is Turkey. So that has pushed the Kurds to negotiate with Damascus. <laughs> um, in theory, Turkey should withdraw from the areas it's come into and allow the Syrian Arab army to move into those areas. So this, eventually the Syrian army will be able to secure its border um, with Iraq and with Turkey. YPG, I think, well, the PKK was YPG, yeah. Yeah. YPG uh, uh, invited the Syrian army, didn't they? Right. They had a choice. Yeah. Uh, well, no, they didn't. I mean, in Afrin, if you remember, um, they didn't. They didn't allow the Syrian Arab army in, and then, of course, Turkey invaded, and they all fled. I'm talking about after the Turkish invasion. Sorry? I'm talking about after the Turkish invasion. Suddenly they found religion, right? Uh, Speaking to... Regime, right? Yeah, of, of course, yeah, because suddenly they thought the U.S. was withdrawing. But actually, when Trump kind of U-turned on his withdrawal, the Kurds flipped again and went back to negotiating with, with the states. I mean, how stupid can you be? We're not going to have no. back and forth. Uh, we're going to have Vanessa will pick hands, and that's how she will get the question. Yes. Yes. Uh, first of all, I appreciate your your talk, Vanessa. Thank you. Uh, and I, I want to dwell on the aspect of uh, the preparation that goes into creating the possibility of these conflicts, because you spoke about that in the early part of your talk. Mm -hmm. And like I'm looking at it in the domestic context, mm -hmm. similarly, like we're having a big struggle here in Ontario to save our uh, uh, health care system mm -hmm. against the conservative. I imagine if the conservatives win in England, you're going to have a big struggle to protect the uh, uh, NHS system there. And I can't believe like the, the ideological forces that are mobilized in the healthcare case in Canada to paralyze the people, to in inundate them with misinformation, mm. and straightforward lies, and so on. So I, I, I wonder if you have a further comment on sort of the ideological character of preparing grounds for these kinds of atrocities to take place? Um, 
Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question. If we actually look at Syria, if I've got a minute, I did actually prepare. Um, I mean, these interventions are prepared well in advance. And I think you're absolutely right to, to highlight that fact. Um, I'll very, very quickly go through this. Um, so, in 2006, you had an article actually in Time magazine, um, Syria in Bush's Crosshairs. Um, <clears throat> and in the article, it basically stated that the Bush administration had been quietly nurturing individuals and parties opposed to the Syrian government in an effort to undermine the regime of President Bashar al-Assad. Um, you, of course, then also had the DIA documents, um, the Department of Intelligence, intelligence agency documents that showed exactly the same thing, that they had been <clears throat> planning on um, funding militant groups inside Syria to overthrow the government. <clears throat> um, if we go to the interview with Professor Jeffrey Sachs, he talked about Operation Timber Sycamore, the CIA operation that basically failed in Syria, and he urged that you know, they leave. But if you go back even to the Chilcot report on the weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, um, and you look at the communications between Bush and Blair between 2001 and 2003, and not forgetting that in 2003 there was the new Middle East conference in Tel Aviv, um, there was the Clean Break Doctrine, the Israeli Clean Break Doctrine in 1999, I think. Um, but the communications between Bush and Blair made it very clear that, that Syria um, was the next target, along, of course, with Iran. Um, and they talk about potentially trying to work on a different relationship with Syria. And, of course, in 2002, Tony Blair offered him or, or proposed an honorary knighthood for Assad. In fact, prior to 2009, you will struggle to find any criticism of President Assad, which is particularly telling. Um, sorry? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that was uh, asthma, yeah. Um, so basically, if you go through those communications, they talk about putting real pressure on Syria to stop the flow of Iraqi oil. They talk about trying to bring Russia on board. And actually, there were leaked diplomatic cables during the last two years, which showed that one of their primary objectives was to basically cut the um, cord between Russia and Syria. Um, of course, to isolate Russia just as much as um, Syria. Um, and then, also, they talked about, in Iraq, financing the militant groups. So, you know, the entire thing, we know from Roland Dumas, the foreign minister um, of France in 2009, that the British had approached him, saying that they were going to basically finance an insurgents in Syria and asked him to be a part of it. So, yeah, you know, this, it, it didn't just... Um, suddenly burst into life in 2011. This entire campaign was planned at least 10 years previously, if not more. Yes, so we have time for a few more questions. Okay. Just a few more, three or so. This gentleman, sorry, I'll come to you. Yeah, I was just wondering, like, when they initiated the war with proxies, hmm. Do you think that they thought that they were going to completely achieve the goal with the proxies, or do they think they were going to militarize, militarize people in Syria itself as well? And are all those people that were proxies, are they all from outside of Syria? No. Um, basically what they did, and again this is mentioned in the um, DIA documents, <coughs> And what they've done since, really, um, Syria achieved its independence from France in 46. If you go forward to 57, there was an assassination attempt against um, high-level members of the current government then. But then this was another operation by the CIA. And there were a number of interventions of that style against Syria um, from 46 onwards. But if you go to um, the 80s, or, or the late 70s, early 80s, again, they, they mobilized and power multiplied the Muslim Brotherhood factions. 
against um, the government of Hafez al-Assad. And of course, the, the putting down of that externally fermented movement um, was in 1982 in Hama, where everybody reports it as the massacre in Hama. And in reality, what nobody ever talks about are the preceding years where